Now you may be wondering, why is this so important? And I don't think anything answers that question quite as well as this picture does right here, which is, this is your produce section of a popular supermarket. Um, on the left here, we have, this is what your produce section looks like with pollinators in particular, in particularly bees. And then on the right, we have um, the produce section without the aid of bees pollinating them. And you might be looking at this and thinking, okay, well, you know, that's kind of scary, but um, we're not going to starve to death because I still see some food in there. And you would be right, but we're going to be very, um, very low on nutrition, sadly. Uh, so the thing is, um, the simple truth is we can't live without pollinators. And there's an ecosystem here um, that's happening. So pollination is more than just this fascinating natural science or natural history. It's, it's an essential ecological function. So everything, it's the food chain, it's the circle of life. Um, pollinators need plants to pollinate. Plants need the pollinators to, to help their generation, you know, help their seeds spread. Um, there are certain birds that need pollinators. They live off of them. We need the fruits and vegetables that pollinators provide us with. So it's a mutually beneficial thing that's happening here. And so it's in our best interest to look after the pollinators. Now, what is pollination? Um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably, probably most of you, if not all of you have um, already gone through grade school. So you're, you've already studied this in school, but let me just give you a very quick review. Pollination is basically plant sex. It's getting the seeds of the male part of the plant to the female part of the plant so fertilization can take place. And so we'll see right here, I don't know if you can see my, or not. So here is the stamen. On the stamen, we have an anther. This is the male part of the flower. And on the anther, this red part, this red dust is pollen. Now the stigma here is the female part of the flower. And as you can see from the cutaway over on this picture here, what happens is the, the pollen from the male part of the flower gets transferred to the stigma, which is the female part of the flower going to the ovaries and that's where the fertilization takes place. Now, the thing with flowers is they're, they're just stable. They're just there. They can't actually make this happen. They need a pollinator to cause this to happen. And so what they're doing is these, these plants are actually kind of broadcasting to pollinators. Come here. You know, I have some really great nectar. I have some pollen. I have a lot of things that you need. And that way, when the pollinators come over to them, they inadvertently transfer the seeds on the anthers here over to the stigma and cause fertilization to um, take place. Now, when you hear about pollinators, you hear this term called pollination syndrome, or a lot of pollinate pollinator enthusiasts will talk about the co-evolution of pollinators and plants. And basically, that's just how plants and pollinators have co-evolved and they have developed physical characteristics to attract each other. And I know that sounds, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's really hard for me to explain, but as we go further through the slides, hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense to you, okay? But basically for the sake of this talk right now, I want you to think like a pollinator. So for the next half hour, you're going to put on your pollinator hat and depending on what pollinator you want to be, I want you to think about what your life is going to be like in your own space, in your backyard, and what kind of pollinator you want to be and what life might be like for you. Okay, so if you're a pollinator, your life is basically to get up, you're going to go out in the morning when the sun comes up, you're going to locate a flower you're gonna evaluate this reward that you want. What is it that you're wanting from this flower, right? And does it have this potential reward for you? And once you figure out that it does, you kind of orient yourself. Are you wanting to land on it? You orient yourself correctly. You land, you forage, you take off and you go to the next flower. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And it seems pretty simple, but like I say, depending on what pollinator you are, you will have different needs and different wants. And so you'll see the world a little bit differently. 
So who and where are the pollinators? First, let's look at where they are. This isn't so important for you to know, but I always think it's pretty interesting. Um, we're here in Contra Costa County right now, and so obviously here in North America. So we're quite kind of familiar with the landscape here. Bees represent 50% of our pollinators here in North America. But what I like to point out is look at what's happening just south of us. Look at what's happening in Central America. So basically right here, what's this all about? We have a lot of black here, which is a bat. We have the white here represented, which is a moth. And you don't, you see a little bit of that in some other countries. You don't see so much of it here. What's going on here that the pollinators are so different? And this is, I'm just wanting to point this out so you can see why pollinators are where they are and what they're doing for various places. And basically your bats and your moths are going to be pollinating at nighttime. And the things that they're going to be pollinating are going to be things like agave, um, cigarro, your tropical fruits like guava and mango. These are actually things which open up, the blossoms open up at nighttime and that's when they're pollinated. And this is where a lot of these things come from is going to be in Central America. So it makes sense that these type of pollinators are there. But notice, like I say, up here in North America, bees are our number one pollinator, followed closely by birds, maybe butterflies, um, wasps, um, and we'll look at a few of these in the next slides. Okay, first of all, I think bees, when we say the word bees, it's synonymous with pollinators. That's the first thing that comes to our mind, are bees. And none more well-known than the honeybee. In fact, I jokingly say that the honeybees probably have the best PR agents of all of the insect world because um, we know so much about them. They're known as social bees because they live in a hive or they're in a swarm, they, they're in a collective. Um, but you know, they're not native to America. We, we depend on them a lot, but they're actually not from here. They come from Europe. They were domesticated, brought over with the earliest settlers to pollinate the crops. And that's what they're still doing. There are only, bear in mind, there are only seven species of honeybees in the world, right? This is important and you'll see why later. Now, bees get a bad rap. A lot of people think, oh, they'll sting you. And, and But actually, they're not. Bees are not aggressive unless you're really keeping them from doing their job, which is to get you know pollen to, their, to the hive. So if you're kind of blocking their path or whatever, they might get a little aggressive. But just know that when they sting, they do die. OK, that brings us to native bees. Now, remember how I was saying that there are seven species of honeybee in the world. Okay, there are 20,000 species of native bees in the whole world, 4,000 of which are here in the US and 1,600 are here in California. We know them also not just as native bees, but as solitary bees because they're not living in a collective. Um, they are, once they come out into the world, they mate and they start laying their eggs for the next generation right away. Their lifespan is usually a lot shorter, maybe four to six weeks. So she gets to work pretty much as soon as she comes out into the world. So when you see them, you're not gonna see them in a collective like swarming around or anything. She comes out here, she's going to get pollen to pack away with her little egg um, and, and make the nursery. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about this later. Now, like I say, they're not in a hive. They nest, 70% of them are nesting underground. So that's one reason why we don't see them. We might see them above ground when they're foraging, but most of the time they're underground or they are nesting in like little cracks and crevices in like old trees or in wood or something like that or in reeds. They're also not aggressive. And um they have a shorter foraging range and it's it's kind of important to note this because like I say, we'll, we'll be talking later about how she builds her nest, but basically she's going out there gathering some pollen, going back, laying an egg, 
leaving her egg with a little bit of pollen and sealing the egg in. So she doesn't wanna to have to travel for two or three miles to go and do this many, many times. So the foraging range for these type of bees is normally 50 feet to half a mile. And compare that to a honeybee, which is about, it can be two miles and it can be as big as three or four miles even. So there are lots of different types of native bees. Um, I always laugh a little bit when, when you look at their common names, it reminds me of those medieval England names where they would, people would take this surname of, um, whatever job or trade they would have. So you would have, you know, Mr. Miller, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Farmer, um, whatever. And bees are very similar to this. So we have the carpenter bee here and I should note that this is the carpenter bee right here. And this is actually a honeybee. So you can notice the size difference between the two of them. There's a leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutter bees are pretty awesome because they cut little bits of leaves out and that's what they make their um, nursery. That's what they make their nest with is little cuttings of leaves. Longhorn bees are known for their long antenna. Uh, green sweat bees. Often people don't realize that these are actually bees because they're very, very tiny and they're green, which is not a color we often associate with bees. They're very tiny. And we know of them when you're ever in a human situation, they're always swarming around you because they're attracted to the salt in your sweat. And they're, like I say, they're very little, little and very bright green. Valley carpenter bee. I've never seen one in person, but I really hope someday too, because they look like teddy bears. And I don't know, I would get stung by one because I would so much want to pet it or something. I don't know. They just look so soft. Um, and then of course, digger bees are under the ground. Now, bee pollinated flowers. Remember when I was talking about the pollination syndrome and what how various pollinators see the world differently? Well, bees see the world in ultraviolet. So they don't see red so much, a little bit of orange, sometimes yellow, but a lot of your blue, violet, purple kind of colors they'll they'll be attracted to. Um, shape is kind of important. They can handle a variety of shapes because they like to, to rest on the, the plant that they're on or the flower that they're on while they're foraging. Um, fragrance isn't that important. They usually like nectar, but pollen is very, very important to them. And the pollen that they gather will be sticky, especially for like the honeybees that like to take the extra pollen back to the hive, they pack it on their legs, which we call saddlebags. And I'll show you what that looks like in a while. So just remember, if you're a bee, you're getting up in the morning, you're going out there and you're seeing the world in ultraviolet, you're looking for colors and you're looking for pollen. Okay, butterflies. <laughs> Butterflies, they're butterflies and hummingbirds, I think are the sweethearts of our yard. We all love them, don't we? Um, here we have um, a picture of a few common ones that we have here in California. The monarch, sadly, we have much fewer than we used to. Um, the Western tiger swallowtail um, here on a butterfly bush, the painted lady here on lantana and the Gulf fritillary here. I think this is on a passion flower. Um, the monarch here is going to be on a broadleaf milkweed. Okay, butterfly pollinated flowers. I've got to point this out. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but notice here, I think this is a zinnia. Notice here on the bottom of the zinnia, um, the spider. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's a really big spider right below. So I think this picture always needs dramatic amuse music, you know, for special effects or whatever, because it's a very dramatic looking picture, I think. Um, butterflies are going to be drawn in by red, orange, yellow, purple. They like a wide landing pad. They can't smell and um, but nectar is very important to them. Pollen, not so much, but nectar is actually very, very important to them. Um, we, there's a syndrome called um, puddling or mud puddling that um, butterflies like to do. And so since they're seeking nectar a lot because they're using so much energy, they're not often getting enough minerals in their um, diet. And so with puddling, what sometimes you might see is if there's like a little mud puddle, you'll see 
butterflies all over it. And what they're doing is they're sucking the salts and minerals out of the out of the soil. So we'll talk about that a little bit later and how you can set up a puddling area for um, butterflies. Now, here's something. This is a do as I say, not as I do situation. This is something I learned the hard way. Um, when I started thinking about butterflies, all I thought is just, you know, which I do with a lot of pollinators in the beginning, I was thinking, give them some food, give them stuff with nectar, give them stuff with pollen, they'll be happy. But that's kind of like giving a human just a restaurant, you know, they need, they need a lot more than that, they need a place to sleep, they need a place to, to build their nursery, they need an echo system or an echo environment to to live in. So it's not just about food. And the thing when we think about butterflies, often people will put something like butterfly bush or, or something with a lot of nectar out for butterflies. But what they're not bearing in mind is that they need a larval host plant or a host plant. So when the butterflies go to lay their eggs, just note that when this, um, the caterpillars actually aren't going to be going for nectar, they need something else to, to so they can create um, so they can become a butterfly basically um, during this process. And so what I've done here is I've put the narrow leaf milkweed and the showy milkweed, these two pictures right here. And I wanna point out that this is for the monarch. So not all host plants go for all butterflies. I've put this here for the monarchs because the monarchs are in serious decline and people are always asking what kind of um, Host plant can I use for them? And the, so these two here are the kinds that you should be looking for. Um, thankfully, because they are in serious decline, there are a lot of organizations out there that are helping get people seeds for milkweed um, and provide places where you can go and get them. So, so do think about the larval host plant. And like I say, the two that I'm showing you here are just for the monarch. Different butterflies have different host plants that they're interested in. And there's so many of them that I'm actually gonna be sending this to you as a handout later so you can know which one um, goes with which. Okay, when planting um, any plants for butterflies, remember plant them in full sun and also protect them from the wind. I have a bit of a problem here where I live because um, it's extremely windy here. So I know a lot of people that live in this area where I am will often put taller plants behind where the wind is coming in just to kind of um, shelter that area for the butterflies because they're so light, they, they get easily kind of knocked around. And here we are in the hummingbirds. Like I say, these are, these are our backyard sweethearts, we all love hummingbirds. If you live here in Northern California, you're familiar with Anna's hummingbird and they make Northern California their residency. Allens and Rufus come from the South and they migrate. So they come up here um, early in the year. The Allens comes in um, North probably around January and then they return South around May or June. Um, the Rufus also migrates up from Mexico and the black chinned comes through Northern California a little bit later, probably around April. But um, the Anna's is the one we'd be most familiar with. Now hummingbirds can't, um, they can't smell, but they're very attracted to red, orange, white, and yellow. Um, obviously because of the shape of their beak and their tongue, they prefer things that are tubular in shape or kind of funnel in shape. And um, it makes sense that they need a whole lot of nectar. Pollen, the flowers will obviously have some pollen because they want to be pollinated, but it's the nectar which is gonna be the reward for the hummingbird. Um, I was reading somewhere the other day that pound for pound, that the nectar that a hummingbird needs each day is the same as a 747 pound for pound, how much fuel it needs. Um, it's burning a lot of calories all the time. And so it's constantly having to eat and nectar is what it's looking for. Um, something to bear in mind with regards to nectar and pollen is even when we're thinking about bees, um, their nectar and pollen needs vary depending on how how far they travel, how fast they travel, and what their body needs are. Just like with humans, um, an athlete is gonna need 
their nutritional requirements are going to be a lot different than my nutritional requirements. So we all need some carbohydrates and we need some proteins, but um, depending on how their bodies are using it, they'll need different amounts of it. And they know where to find that, where to source that. Okay, everybody always asks about hummingbird feeders. Um, can I have one in my yard? Is it okay? And I always tell them what I would tell any eight-year-old who wants a puppy. Um, you can have one as long as you are responsible and you take care of it. It comes with responsibility. You have to clean it out. And especially with this type of hummingbird feeder that I'm showing here, it must be cleaned out at least once a week. If it's not cleaned out, um, there can you can get salmonella, you can get black mold, and you will be causing more harm than doing good. Um, it's not necessary to go to the store and buy hummingbird nectar. It's just sugar and water. So it's four parts um, boiling water to one part sugar so you can make your own. And I've seen in some stores, they actually color it red. Don't do that. I mean, you have the red flowers here. Remember how I said they like, they're attracted to red. You've got the red flowers here. So the nectar doesn't need to be red. Um, I personally don't have this kind of a hummingbird feeder because it is a lot of work. I've already got enough on my plate already, and I don't know that I had the time to really keep this up. But I was really happy when one of my colleagues pointed this type of a feeder out there, which I hear is much easier to fill, much easier to clean. And so it's like a shallow bowl type of feeder where they'll sit around the side and they eat out, they eat out of it from the top. So... And one of the people is on our panel today who actually provided these pictures and she uses them. So if you have questions about that, you can ask her. And now for time's sake, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the other pollinators, which are bats and moths. Both of them, as I mentioned before, pollinate things at nighttime. Um, there's something funny about bats. This is actually an Australian bat, but the funny thing about bats is they're so expressive when they're attracted to pollen and when they're pollinating because they just look so happy. Um, you don't see, I'm sure all of the rest of them are equally as happy when they, when they find nectar and pollen, but bats just look so happy. Um, moths, um, as I mentioned, they also pollinate at nighttime. Sometimes it's difficult to tell what's a butterfly and what's a moth. Um, a moth, when it's at rest, often will be flat, like a plate, so it'll be opened up, its wings will stay open, or in a butterfly, when it's at rest, its wings will come up together. Um, beetles, beetles are, <laughs> people joke about them being really messy because they eat, they not only pollinate, but they eat the leaves, they eat the petals, they do their business on the leaves. They're just kind of messy pollinators, um, but they are very cute and they like something that's very flat because it's really easy for them to, they're a bit heavy, so it's easier for them to fall off. Um, flies are kind of interesting because um, there's a bit of trickery that goes on in the pollinating world with flies. So things that are wanting to attract flies will often put out this smell. They're very much um, attracted by smell. And, you know, if you know anything about flies, they'll lay their eggs in kind of like um, rancid meat. And so a lot of pollinators that want to attract flies will put out this really putrid smell that attracts the fly and they don't give them any reward for it. It's just to attract them there. And so in the pollinator world, sometimes pollinators and, um, and plants are a little bit sneaky about how they attract each other and what they're, what they're doing in their world. Now, wind pollination is another type of pollination um, that you know, we don't think of when we think of pollinators. Um, I've put this picture here because I think it's just really dramatic. It's one of these uh, pictures that actually shows the pollen. It's often you don't see it in the air flying around like this. You normally see it like on the picture um, that's here to the right where it's all over your car. Or it's, you know, up in your nasal passages or whatever. This is actually a pine tree, so it's not food or anything, but there are a lot of foods that are wind pollinated. Um, some of our nut producing trees like walnuts, pecans, Pistachios are usually wind pollinated. And then of course, a lot of our grains. So wheat, rice, barley, oats, and um, corn. So here we have corn, which is being cross-pollinated here. So we have the 
pollen, which is right here. And it needs to get blown from top of the corn over to the silk here and vice versa. So this is cross pollination and the wind carries that. So unlike the uh, pine that it's just like dust, this is a heavier pollen. It may travel maybe 50 feet or so. Um, and finally, buzz pollination. Buzz pollination is really interesting. Um, carpenter bees, bumblebees, and sweat bees are often our buzz pollinators, and they are especially known for pollinating solanaceous crops, also known as nightshades. So there are tomato, um, eggplant, some uh, peppers, tomatillo. These are the solanaceous plants that are buzz pollinated. And you may remember the, the plant that we saw earlier, the cutaway flower on the pollination diagram, where it was all open and the male and female parts were all exposed and the, the bee or the pollinator can move around on the top here. Here, actually, in this type of plant, they're hanging a little bit upside down and they're closed. And so what has to happen is one of these bees, like a bumblebee, she'll come up here and she hangs upside down. And as she's trying to get towards the pollen, I don't know if you can see, I tried to put a close up of it here. So as she's here holding on upside down and she's trying to get to the pollen, she, the vibrations of her body are actually knocking the pollen down onto her abdomen. And as she's moving around, she's actually fertilizing um, this plant here, which is really kind of kind of amazing. So these type of plants, these solanaceous crops can actually self-fertilize. So your tomatoes, if you don't have any, um, if you don't have any pollinators, they will self-pollinate. However, um, if you feel like you you're not getting as many tomatoes as you feel like you should be getting, you can actually simulate what a bee is doing by taking, I've seen people use the back of a electric toothbrush and they'll like go up to the plant and they'll kind of push it up against and the vibration of that toothbrush will kind of knock down some of the pollen onto the stigma. Um, that's a little over the top. Don't go out and buy an electric toothbrush because you can equally just go over there and take your finger and kind of tap it. Pollinator populations are declining. Why is that? Actually, there's a number of reasons why this is happening. First of all, we're destroying their habitat. If you've lived in California for a, a long time, you will, you will notice as you're driving around, you know, oh my gosh, this used to be a field before and now it's suddenly um, an urban, urban sprawl everywhere. So um, remember how I was saying a lot of these native um, bees, they live underground or they're in trees. We're pushing all that aside. We're putting pavement out there. We're putting golf courses and they don't have a natural habitat anymore. Um, broad spectrum pesticide use is a really, really major problem here in the US, um, everywhere on the farm, in the garden and in the orchard. Um, it really contribu contributes highly to colony collapse disorder, which was 35 of more than one third um, of the honeybees died in 2019. Not all because of um, pesticide use, but pesticide use definitely was a big contributor to it. And I'd like to point out neonicotinoids, which is a systemic type of insecticide. It's water soluble. It can stay in the soil. Any water runoff, it goes into our water. I think I read somewhere that 90% of the um, water in Southern California has neonicotinoids in it. In Northern California, our urban water has maybe a little bit over 50% has neonics, neonics in it. Um, Children's blood has been tested. It's been shown to have a, a slight traces of neonicotinoids in it because children are eating, you know, fruits and vegetables that have been treated with this. Um, what we're trying to do here in California right now, very, very recently, only in the last two or three months, there's a bill that's been put forward where they're trying to take um, neonics off of um, to keep them from being used, say, for example, in golf courses and in your lawns and things like this. They were made to be used for crops or for food, and you can buy them in big box stores right now. The problem is they're not 
it's it's not it's not going to say neonicotinoid type of pesticide on it when you go to a big box store to buy it. Um, it's not going to come with any warnings. So what I've done here is I've put the six chemicals, which are which are neonicotinoid um, chemicals. Um, don't use these. Like I say, in California, they're really trying to take these off of the market, at least for urban use right now. So. Um, yeah, it's a big concern. In Europe, they're doing a lot better about this, but here in America, we're kind of slow at addressing this problem. They've only been around for probably since the 1990s, so it may still be a little bit too early to say what the long-term issues that we could have as a result of these, but they're definitely contributing to the decline in um, pollinators. Um, the introduction of non-native plants and insects is another thing that can happen that causes a decline. Light pollution. It's something that you don't think of, but remember when I was telling you with moths, um, they pollinate at night. If all the street lights are on and all of our house lights are on, moths are attracted to the lights, which actually kind of distracts them from pollinating in the evening, right? Um, climate change is another thing that is contributing so that where they pollinate um, that range is, is changing. And of course, there's always going to be, as with humans, disease um, can come and affect you know, their population as well. Now, you might be wondering now, so how can I help? You know, how can I attract pollinators into um, my space. I want you to start looking at your space with your garden or your yard or, or balcony or, or whatever space you have and are thinking about using to attract pollinators as an ecosystem. Um, earlier I said don't think of it as just a place for them to come and eat. Think of it as a place for them to come and live, to come and drink, to have their nurseries and a place for shelter for them as well. So when you're preparing this habitat, open sunny areas, introduce some natives. Natives are good. Um, I'm not a purist. You don't have to have all natives, but some natives are good and I'll explain why later. Um, have continuous bloom throughout the growing season. Don't have all plants out there that only bloom in April and then it's just dead the rest of the time. Um, you know, if you go out and buy plants, you'll notice on there, it'll say, you know, the blooms, this will bloom in late. June, or this will bloom in September, this will bloom in April. Try to get different colors and different bloom times going. Have varying flowers, varying sizes, and varying colors, and try to clump them together. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. So a variety of plants is important. Um, I've given you a little bit of an idea. I should say right now, you are not going to be all things to all pollinators. Okay, so don't try to think you're going to put this um, pollinator habitat and all of the pollinators will come. Um, when I send you some information, it'll show you, it, oh, if you plant this upright rosemary, it's attractive to this kind of bee and this kind of bee. So there are very few things that all pollinators will use. As I said before, you know, they have different needs, different sort of nutritional needs and different things that attract them. Um, sunflowers seem to be one of the things though that everybody seems to like a lot. So if you're interested in that, you can put some sunflowers out. Types of plants. You're gonna hear the terms native, non-native, naturalized and invasive. What does that mean? There are actually terms for this and, um, I'll tell you, native as the federal government defines it. It's all species of plants and animals naturally occurring either presently or historically in an ecosystem in the US. So when we talk about native plants, normally it will have an adjective of a region. This is the California poppy, or you will have a certain type of bird which is native to the Midwest, or you will have a certain type of tree which is native to the Northeast. So it will show you a region where it is native, and it has been here for many hundreds and thousands of years. And it's it does very well in this climate, in this soil, and in the environment here. Non-native, however, is gonna be something that has been brought in, usually by people, um, maybe intentionally, maybe not, and non-native doesn't mean that it's bad. Um, so I don't want you to think that non-native, a lot of times it needs a little bit more care because it's just not 
native here. But if it stays here long enough, it kind of gets comfortable and it, it, it kind of gets comfortable and knows its way around and it needs less care. And at that point, it's naturalized. And then, of course, there are invasive plants. And invasive plants are things which can cause harm to either the economy, the environment, or people. Exotics are things which come from another country. Um, your eucalypts from Australia, you know, your Japanese maples, uh, things like this. Uh, translocated means it's come from maybe another part of the country you're in. So maybe your grandmother's favorite rose bush, she's given you a clipping and you've started it here. Um, and then of course there are weeds, which need no explanation. Native plants, um, they're four times more attractive to pollinators. Like I say, they've co-evolved together. They know how to work together and they like each other. Gordon, um, Frankie's, uh, UC Berkeley Urban, um, Urban Garden has shown that when he plants both natives and non-natives, the native bees will always gravitate towards the native plants. Again, it's not good or bad. It just shows that there's a preference there. The thing that they're adapted, as I say, to the region, soil, and climate. And the selling point for me is that they're low maintenance, um, wherein there's some things that are absolutely beautiful, but they need a whole lot of personal attention until they really get you know, situated. Uh, herb gardens have a lot of flowering things there. I encourage people, you know, a lot of times we'll pinch off the flowers of the herbs to encourage the leaves to grow more. Um, I tell people, leave the flowers on there for a little while and let the pollinators enjoy them before pinching them off. Another thing is plant in vari var varying heights and colors. So I have an example here of lavender, salvia, and Santa Barbara daisies. And imagine, okay, you're a bee, you're coming into this, and you could see the lay of the land really well. So not only is varying heights and colors good for the bees, I mean, it's very aesthetically pleasing for people too. As we look out into that, we can see all of the colors at one time. Now, the Hagen Dawes Honeybee Haven. Um, in UC Davis is open to the public. You'll have to check their hours and you know the times that they're open, but it is open to the public. And it's a really good um, bee habitat that you could go to and have a look at what kind of plants they use and how they plant them. So remember when I was saying they're um, planting clumps and plant where you can see different kinds of things, you can notice here how they are planted. We have clumps here and clumps here, clumps here. So if you're a bee, just imagine just flying around here. You can really see things very clearly. You can also plant um, clumps of flowers in your vegetable gardens. And I believe this is in um, the uh, Contra Costa um, Master Gardener Demonstration Garden where we have some uh, clumps of flowers planted here amongst the vegetables. So that brings the pollinators pollinators into your vegetable garden. Again, we have different sizes, um, which I mentioned before is very important. Sterile hybrids are something that I want you to be aware of because these have been created just to have extra blossoms on them. And often in a lab created situation, they are taking out the pollen, they're taking out the nectar. They're really of no use to pollinators, but they're very pretty. Um, if you're looking on seed packets, I believe they're marked with an F1 or F2 on them to show that they're a um, hybrid and what generation of hybrid they are. Water and mud is something that we often don't. We think about their food, we think about their nectar and their pollen, but what about water and mud? Okay, bees get thirsty, especially honeybees, right? Remember how I said they're traveling two, three miles, you know, they get thirsty. So I always encourage people to leave out either a bird bath with a little bit of water, put some rocks in there. Um, you'll be surprised that when you do this, they don't, it's easy for them to, to tip in and they can drown otherwise. So put a few little stones in there so they can have some place to rest while they're um, drinking water. Butterflies, as I may have mentioned before, get their minerals and nutrition from moist soil. So I know this looks a little bit kind of dirty over here, but there's there's water in here, there's stones for bees to rest on, and there's moist soil here so that the butterflies have a chance to get minerals. Um, they often, uh, butterflies are taking in a lot of nectar, and so they're not getting the nutrients that they need. They're getting potassium, 
but they're not getting magnesium, I think it is. And that's what they need from, from soil. Sometimes people have recommended putting a little bit of sea salt in there. I'm not gonna go there. I just put in some, um, just a little bit of soil and there's a net, there should be enough nutrients in there for them there. So keep it a little bit moist. And of course, native bees uh, use some of the mud to make their nest. That leads us to our next topic, which is habitat. So remember how I said a lot of your native bees live underground? Um, go and clear off a little bit of mulch. If you have one of these houses, which is either all grass or mulch, clear off a bit of mulch. I mean, you may not want it right beside your house, but go to the far end of that, of your garden and just clear a path. So they, they're not going to dig through mulch to get to the soil. And here we see a bee going towards, um, going towards its little entry to its homeway. I was so excited. Often this is going to be near where, um, the plants are that they're actually going to be foraging. And I was really excited to see in my hillside, which I don't go up to very often, there are little holes that look like kind of chopsticks have been like pushed into it. And I thought, oh, I saw bees coming and going out of it. And it really made me happy. So they found a home there. Um, you can use little reeds here. People have used bamboo, put it in a pipe here um, for for bees to, to nest in, the ones that aren't underground and that are actually nesting in like reeds or in little hollows of trees or whatever, you can make your own. Here's an example here of somebody who has made their own um, bee house. And um, basically you can just drill holes in old pieces of wood and make sure that they're at least, it's a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch the holes are. Make sure they're at least three inches deep to six inches deep. And it's a really good way to um, provide them with a home. They, they don't ask for much. And I'll show you um, in a couple of slides how you how, what that looks like if you make your own. And here's a bumblebee. Bumblebees um, live, live underground. So here's a bumblebee nest here. So here's a cutaway of what this looks like. Remember when I was telling you the female native bee is going to go out there and she's going to get a bit of pollen and she's going to come into this reed or she's going to come into this like little hole, um, this, this hollowed out piece of wood or whatever, and she's going to go right to the back of it. She's going to put her pollen in there, a little lunchbox for her egg, and she'll lay her egg. And then as you can see right here, she puts a wall up. So she gets a little bit of mud there, whatever, and puts a wall up. And then she repeats it. She puts here, here's another little bit of pollen. She'll lay an egg here and she'll put up another wall. Here's another bit of pollen and so and so and so it goes. Um, here's what this looks like. It goes from very small to right the way through overwintering when it's ready to come out and create its own family. Leaf cutter bees um, are really great. It looks like a cigar, doesn't it? They, they cut out little pieces of leaves and roll them up. And they're basically doing what the um, mason bees were doing is they'll find a little, a little hollowed out area and then they go and create their nursery in there. Now, one of the people on our panel tonight actually let me use her slides and she's created her own um, native bee house. And it's a really good example of, of um, what a good native bee house looks like. So here you can see the front, you can see all the little holes that are drilled just perfectly. So you don't want them too big because other things like wasp or birds can get to them and eat them, but you don't want them so small that they can't get in and out of it. So it's important how big you make the, uh, make the holes for these. And in the back, um, it's sealed up, but you could see that she's made it to you to be able to get to the back. And here's why. Because basically what she does is, she can probably tell you about this later, is to take parchment paper and roll it into like a little straw and put it in there. And the nice thing about that is when the bee goes in and creates her nest and everything in there. I mean, it's going to be dirty. She's got all these walls and pollen and everything in there. And so at the end of the season, you just pull them out, roll another one up and put it in. So it's all nice and neat and clean. So other ways you can attract pollinators or plant multiples of the same plant in one or more location. Um, plant seasonal sequence of plants, uh, spring, summer, and winter blooming. So your spring and summer blooms are gonna be things like California poppies, manzanitas, yarrow, sunflowers, lavender, catmint. Um, your summer fall is gonna be things like cosmos, pumpkin squash, coneflowers, 
um, thyme, milkweed, fuchsia. Plant in the sun. Also, I should say, if you've got these little houses that you're building for native bees, face them in the east. So when the sun comes up, it warms them up and they can come out um, and start, start their day. And then of course, use minimal or no pesticides. And whatever you do, if you use any form of pesticides, avoid using pesticides when the plants are flowering because um, that's when the pollinators are actually going to be active. So you might be saying like, what can I do? It's all very overwhelming. Um, this is just, I am just about one person. What can I do? I always tell people do one thing, okay? Add one native plant or grow one kind of food and that can be in a container. It doesn't have to be anything big. Dispose of one kind of pesticide, herbicide or insecticide. I'm gonna be sending you a link or maybe somebody could put a link in the chat right now of um, the University of California IPM, um, which is an integrated pest management. They have a site where you can actually key in what kind of leading ingredients of any of the pesticides you may have. And it will tell you there um, who this is bad for and how seriously bad it is. Because if you're like me, they're chemicals and you don't know, you know, which one is better, or which one is worse, get rid of one of them. Really educate yourself and get to know, but we have a really good reference. And so, like I say, somebody may be posting that in the chat already for you to go and look up. It's a good resource to use. Um, when you dispose of the pesticides, um, you have to do it in a hazardous waste facility. Um, there are three that I know of here in Contra Costa County. And I think we have a link for that, which somebody might be putting in the chat right now too. So there's one in Antioch, one in Richmond, and one I think in Martinez. You have to live in this county in order to go and dispose of it. So they'll ask you for your ID when you go and do that. Um, allow one pest to live, get to know, also in this IPM website, get to know what your beneficial insects are. Don't go around killing everything. There are actually some really good insects out there that are helping helping you. Um, and make room for native bees, you know, give them, clear out some mulch and get them some water or some mud, you know, make room for them in your yard, okay? And just remember, oh, and also, Tell your friends, tell your friends, tell your grandkids, tell everyone, get, it, get other people excited. Tell your neighbors about it and see if you can come together and, and do something to help them. And just remember, if you're creating a pollinator habitat, you're doing two things at the same time. You're increasing the chances that your gardens are gonna be pollinated and you're also providing a habitat for pollinators whose numbers may be threatened. And with that, <laughs> I am gonna ask you, you didn't know there was gonna be homework, okay? It's really good for you to come and educate yourself, coming to a lot of these talks and things or reading a book or um, watching a documentary and learning about this, but I really want you to commit to doing one thing before the end of the week. And I think we've got a little poll-like thing. You can do one, you can do more than one if somebody would like to share that. And I basically want before the end of the week for you to pledge to do one thing. I'm not asking you to buy anything. I'm not asking you even to leave your home and go out and get something. There are things that you can do even when we finish here this evening, there's something that you can do and you can be done with your homework. But I'd like you to commit to either, so before the end of the week, I want you to pledge to, I've launched the poll, Annette, so people can see what the options are. And if you can't see the whole poll, do... do oh, I can read it. I can read it out for people if they can't see it. So basically... Okay. Um, they just have to page down. Some people only saw half the page, and you just have to move your cursor down to get the whole poll. Okay. Or, or stretch the screen out a little bit or whatever. Yeah, but okay, people are responding now. This is great. Oh, excellent. It's excellent. moving very quickly. And my gosh, it's almost like a race. Because, <laughs> this is uh, exciting. People are responding to every single one differently. It's it's interesting. I, I can't wait to share. Oh, that's really good. And you don't have to you don't have to choose just one, you can do more than one thing, but at least do one thing. And, and, you know, I feel like if people commit to doing something and if they get the ball rolling, it's easier to do that second thing later. Once, you know, you make these little changes, 
you start seeing the reward for these changes. And then that gives you the fuel to want to do even more. And it's really exciting. So in the smallest little thing, when I put when I put a stone in my bird bath, I noticed right away that there were a lot more bees there within about a week. There were multiples of bees actually sitting on the stone. And so it really made me happy. It's, um, it's a gift that you can give back to yourself. So you're not only helping them. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. And we got lots of responses. Oh, great. Um, it looks like the the most popular one is to put a shallow pan outside, fill it with water and a couple of stones. Oh, that's really great. And that's really that great. The next one is tell somebody about something that you learned today. But all, all of the options were very, very popular. So congratulations to everybody. Oh, that's really, really great. Oh, thank you guys. And um, yeah, do that before the end of the week. And like I say, you will, these little things, you will start seeing results very, very quickly and it will be very rewarding. And, you know, I just want to say that, you know, I started out this talk telling you all of this really bad stuff that's going on. There's statistics that are really heartbreaking when you read them, but you know, there's some really great stuff that's happening out there as well. As more people like you are getting involved and you're learning about what can be taking place, we're seeing lots of big things that are changing. Some grassroots movements are taking place. I know in Virginia, they're doing something where they're actually helping to, um, they're getting beehives distributed to people that are interesting and ha interested in having them, or they are giving money to people who have beehives. So they're incentivizing it. Um, there is something that is called um, the No Mo May, which started in UK, and it's actually come over here um, in the in the states. And basically, what's happening with No Mo May is they're um, getting either towns or even just just um, neighborhoods are, are coming together and they're saying, right, we're not going to mow our grass in the whole month of May because that's when a lot of your pollinating flowers, your wild flowers are like coming up. And come on, we're all Americans. You know how it is. We all like our, our gardens all manicured and all looking very pretty and everything. But with no mow May, you're going to get dandelions. You're going to get clovers. You're going to get these kind of things that come up. But don't let them go to seed. Just allow the pollinators to get started on them. And Again, just pat yourself on the back for doing a good job. So there are a lot of um, cities, HOAs are coming together saying that they agree that they will waive all of their um, rules that they have for the month of May. So that's kind of cool to see that. And in UK, they've also got things like, the, I think in Brighton, in UK, every new building that is built has to have a certain amount of B bricks in it. So there are bricks that actually have holes in it for um, native bees. And like I mentioned earlier in California, the um, is AB 2146 um, Act, which has been put forward to have neonicotinoids taken off of, you know, urban, urban use. This has only just happened in February, March this year. So it's passed the assembly and it's in the pipelines now. So keep an eye on that. So there are lots of things that we all can be doing. And I'm so grateful that you all came, you know, today. And I hope you hope you learned something and hope I made you excited to go out and help these help these little guys out. <laughs>